Ah, we're back for the second half of World Civilizations. This is session nine today, and we're looking at the Cuban Revolution. We just got finished talking about the historical background of Cuba in terms of some of the forces that shaped Cuba's history uh, during especially the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century. And we saw certain themes and patterns that come out of that historical past uh, that influence the eventual revolution that we're going to look at in just a moment in 1959. And those include the economy's dependence upon sugar, which was this long history stretching from the 18th century on, and the negative consequences that could have in times of economic problems internationally, uh, that it had catastrophic consequences, for example, at the end of the 1920s and early 1930s, with Cuba so heavily dependent upon a single export product. We've also seen the inequalities that were associated with this economic system, whether it was the time of slavery in the late 18th and uh, through the first three quarters of the 19th century or later, even after emancipation, where the plight of sugar workers is acute um, due to uh, low levels of income and amounts of work that they are able to do. Uh, we find that there is considerable suffering in the Cuban countryside as a result of the impact of the sugar economy. We've also seen the uh, influence the United States had during the 19th and throughout the first half of the 20th century, not only in trying to acquire Cuba, but perhaps more importantly, after the intervention uh, in 1898, its attempt to transform Cuba, to Americanize Cuba. Uh, certainly that was accomplished to a considerable degree in terms of the presence of U.S. corporations. Um, by 1929, uh, American corporations had invested one and a half billion dollars uh, in Cuba. So uh, American companies had an enormous presence there and dominated the sugar economy, banking, transportation, uh, electrical generation, as we've seen, telephone systems, ITT, for example, uh, was in Cuba. So that American companies come to be uh, an enormous presence within the economy. Uh, but more than that, although it certainly has important significance for the political system as well, uh, because so many Cubans turn to politics as an alternative road to advancement, given the very large role that Americans had in the general domestic economy. But beyond that, there are the efforts of American companies and American leaders uh, to transform Cuba, to Americanize Cubans, hmm. teach them English, teach them to work and act like Americans, to be consumers like Americans, scientific management. And certainly a degree of bias as well in the dealings with Cubans, believing that Cubans were not the equal of Americans when it came to professional skills and employment, displacement of Cuban sugar workers by Haitian immigrants, huh? the fact that Cuban professionals had to accept second-class citizenship within American companies. All of these issues uh, have a vital impact upon Cuba's history and become uh, apparent in the outbreak of the 1933 revolutionary upheaval. Uh, because the revolution's goals in terms of creating more equitable society, uh, establishing worker control in the economy, and the vehement anti-Americanism that comes out as Cubans reject uh, the long-standing economic and political domination of the United States and this attempt to radically transform Cubans into Americans or some version of Americans. All of these factors come to the surface in 1933, only to be suppressed in 1934 when Batista essentially takes the reins of power, although he does not become president until later years. And as we pointed out in the first half, these problems were really not resolved. Uh, certainly stability returned to Cuba as a result of Batista's intervention. Uh, but the succession of presidents, whether it was Batista himself or uh, Raul San Martin or Prio, none of these people really managed to resolve these problems for Cuba. And Cuba remained, uh, as of the 1950s, a society in which there were acute uh, social and economic inequalities, particularly between people living in the urban areas and the majority of people living in the countryside. And it remained a country uh, that was heavily beholden to the United States for its uh, economic well-being in terms of massive U.S. investment, its dependence upon uh, the United States for its uh, sugar market. In fact, the United States government uh, during the 1920s had established a quota system uh, for Cuban sugar, guaranteeing Cuba a certain percentage of the American market. So that dependence uh, was not only based on U.S. investment, but also on the fact that there was a certain guaranteed market for Cuban sugar in the United States. Yet at the same time, 
Cuba had not resolved its problems of uh, inequality and indeed economic inefficiency. Part of the historic compromise that Batista fashioned in promising uh, unionized work, as some say in the process of gaining uh, some degree of economic advancement, also meant uh, that the unions had enormous influence and the unions had become very conservative uh, in Cuba at this time, hoping to maintain the living standards of at least those people who are fortunate enough to be members of unions in Cuba. That means they are largely opposed to innovation in the economic system. So there is a price to be paid for this historic compromise. Yes, the workers surrender their radical demands, uh, and the companies have to make uh, minimal economic concessions, but it also means that Cuban workers remain acutely sensitive to any attempts to displace workers, to deprive them of jobs. So you get an economy that is not terribly efficient, and you get a political system that is still marked by acute corruption uh, into the 1950s. And this remained true even after Batista's intervention in 1952 to once again take power. Uh, these forces were simmering to the surface, though. They could only be repressed for so long. And indeed, they would come to the surface in the person uh, of this young man at the time, Fidel Castro. Castro uh, was the son of a fairly well-to-do uh, farmer, wouldn't call him a member of the wealthy elite, but he had certainly uh, uh, had made a reasonable amount of money as a farmer uh, in Cuba, uh, well enough off to send his son off for education by the Jesuits and then on to the University of Havana where he became a law student. Castro also became uh, a political activist and again this is not an unusual uh, turn of events for students in Latin America where national political parties uh, are very active on university campuses and people often begin political careers by involving themselves in the university politics of national parties and that's precisely what Castro himself did. However, uh, university politics in Cuba in the 1950s is not quite on the rather tame, even subdued uh, level that you see it on most American campuses today. Uh, at that time, political clashes in Cuba among students were violent. Uh, and it was not unusual that uh, students would take up arms against each other or against certain professors uh, who did not share their political beliefs. Now, this all might seem a bit extreme, uh, but the fact is that uh, violence in politics uh, was another way of making one's, up, making one's way up a career ladder uh, that had continued to remain extremely narrow, even for university-educated students in Cuba. Uh, in the 1950s. A university education was by no means a guarantee of employment and certainly uh, not of employment that was commensurate with one's uh, academic achievements. So politics and using violence to get into politics and to advance in politics still remained a not uncommon avenue uh, for young Cubans who were looking to move forward. And we can understand uh, their situation, if you think about people who are deprived economically in any society, uh, they may well turn, or a certain number of them are going to turn towards violence as a means of trying to achieve their own economic advancement if the normal methods, the normal career ladders aren't open. Uh, if a society can't provide an assurance that, well, look, if you get your education, you know, behave properly, you'll get a decent job and be able to make a decent living. Well, that was not necessarily true for university educated people in, in Cuba in the 1950s and as a result it was not uncommon for university students to engage in politics and even to use violence in the political process and violence was not entirely uncommon across the national political scene. Uh, for example, Grau San Martin's Minister of Sport uh, was eventually assassinated um, by his political opponents. He himself was probably the cause of the death of several political opponents himself. So the use of violence on the national political scene was a reflection of this problem within Cuba itself where there were limited economic activities. Politics remained one of the avenues available to Cubans and of course it was not unusual for people in desperate circumstances to turn towards violence. Now Castro still had a belief that the political system, the elect electoral system itself, could generate change and reform. And he himself had placed himself forward as a candidate for Congress during the 1952 election. 
Of course, when Batista launches his coup, that's the end of the election. That's the end of the opportunity for Castro uh, to sit in Congress and have some impact upon the process. And indeed, uh, these events pretty well convinced Fidel Castro himself that going on with the normal political process, however that might be defined in Cuba uh, in 1952, simply was hopeless. That the only thing to do now was not simply to take up arms on behalf of one political party or another, uh, but to take up arms to dismantle the existing state, to dismantle the existing political system. That it was so hopelessly corrupt, uh, as made apparent by Batista's coup, that the only answer was armed revolution to overthrow the entire system and start over. So it is now that he becomes convinced of uh, the need for revolution. Now, it's often questioned whether Castro, who would eventually, uh, some years later, hmm, uh, about a decade later, uh, announce that he was in fact a Marxist, uh, was at this time being influenced by Karl Marx and his writings. And the answer is pretty clearly no. Uh, Castro was very much in line with earlier Cuban political figures, earlier revolutionary figures. He was very much a nationalist. He was very much in favor of reform. Uh, but he did not have any particular knowledge or even affinity for uh, the ideas of Karl Marx at this time. Uh, he is much more in the order of the revolutionaries of 1933 or 1895 in terms of his thinking at this time. And indeed, his first revolutionary project indicates he really hasn't thought through the whole idea of revolution and exactly how it works very thoroughly. Uh, what he and a group of followers, other young college educated professionals like himself, plan on doing is attacking the Moncada military bar barracks, which is on the eastern end of the island near Santiago de Cuba. If we look back at this map again for a moment. It's here that they plan to launch their attack on a uh, Cuban military barracks with the idea that they will gain weapons, but more importantly, they will gain national attention and they will be able to uh, bring followers to their sides by this successful and indeed heroic, if not suicidal act. Uh, again, these are people who are by no means hardened revolutionaries. In fact, these are generally urban born, uh, middle class youth. Uh, they have their own cars or borrow their parents' cars to launch the attack. Uh, they're carrying handguns, hunting rifles. Uh, this is what passes for their version of armed revolution at this point. And although they schedule their attack uh, for a day, uh, a holiday, uh, the 26th of July, 1953, hoping to capt uh, capture the uh, barracks by catching the guards unawares, in fact, their attack is a failure. They're poorly armed, they don't know quite what they're doing here, and soon the rebels, including Castro himself, are rounded up and thrown in jail. While he's in jail, uh, Castro writes uh, this treatise called History Will Absolve Me. And it's essentially saying, you know, look what I did was right because we need to take up arms. You may call it illegal, but the fact is the system is terribly corrupt. And talking about the need for radical reform in Cuba, the need for social and economic equality, uh, the need to end Cuba's dependence upon the United States, the domination of the United States. Um, but again, still ideas that were commonly circulating among thoughtful people in Cuba and had been for some decades uh, is what Castro himself expresses in history will absolve me. It's not an innovative revolutionary text, but rather explaining that there is now need for revolution in Cuba itself because of these long-standing problems. Eventually, Castro uh, is allowed uh, his freedom uh, as a result of an amnesty declared. There was an annual amnesty in which uh, the Archbishop of Havana, the Archbishop of the Catholic Church, would ask the president of the country to release certain prisoners. And on this occasion, uh, it was Castro and those around him who were uh, targeted by the Archbishop for this amnesty. And Fulgencio Batista uh, was willing to let them go, in part because they didn't look that dangerous. I mean, they are the middle class, you know, sort of youth who. Uh, apparently have gotten some wild ideas in their heads, so forgive them their mistake and let them go on with their lives. Uh, however, 
Upon his release, Castro was well aware that this was a one-time only deal, that if he returned to his revolutionary activities, clearly Batista would deal with him as he would deal uh, with any challenger, and that would be by eliminating him. So Castro really has to go into exile. He leaves for Mexico uh, because if he's going to carry on revolutionary activities, he better not do it in Cuba if he wants to go on breathing. Uh, in Mexico, he gathers around him a group of followers, some of them from the Moncada Barracks event. In fact, the movement becomes known as the 26th of July movement, which refers to the date of their attack on the Moncada Barracks uh, in 1953. Uh, also joining them uh, is a young Argentinian doctor named Che Guevara. Guevara is one of the few people in the group at this time that is really uh, familiar with uh, Marxism and really uh, is an advocate of M Marx's ideas. Uh, and while he has some influence on the group as a whole, uh, the truth is that uh, the group remains essentially a group of uh, nationalist revolutionaries. Their major reading for ideological indoctrination uh, are the writings of Jose Marti, which indicates this is not exactly a Marxist revolution in the making, not at this point. What the group around Castro, which numbers about 90 people, are planning on doing is invading Cuba, uh, using uh, an opportunity to land on the island, the eastern end of the island where they had tried before, and uh, launching a new rebellion. They secure ownership of a yacht, a yacht owned by an American, and called the Granma, uh, loaded up with weapons and set sail for Cuba with the idea of launching this invasion and using that as the basis for their new rebellion. Now, after they land on the island, on the eastern end of the island again, in Oriente province, uh, they are almost immediately set upon by Batista's forces. Uh, the army becomes aware of the landing and begins chasing them. And they have to flee up into the mountains of Oriente province in order to escape, in order to survive. Survival, however, in the mountains is going to prove to be an extremely treacherous undertaking. Uh, this is rough, rugged country. Uh, there are no readily available sources of food, water, maybe. Uh, there are insects, disease. Uh, sleeping is difficult, and these are almost to a person, with a couple of exceptions, urban middle-class youth. Mm -hmm. They are not prepared to survive in this kind of environment. And as a result, their cause might well have been lost at this stage simply on their inability to survive in the mountainous countryside of eastern Cuba were it not for the peasants whom they encountered. The peasants who live in the mountains of Oriente province, uh, at least some of them, are the descendants of those Afro-Cubans who had fled slavery on the western end of the island uh, at the closing of the 19th century and who, whose forefathers had established themselves in Oriente province with small land holdings, working on haciendas communeras, etc. And it was their grandfathers, fathers, who had been displaced by the coming of the American companies like United Fruit after the American intervention. So here we come back to these historical events and find that they intersect with Castro's activities in 1954-55 here in the eastern end of the island. It is here that these two forces intersect. And beginning in 1956, that Castro begins to form a bond with these people. They are outcasts in Cuban society. They're among the rural poor, among the poorest of the rural poor, uh, scratching out an existence, raising a few basic crops, growing a little bit of marijuana and selling that. It's illegal, but it helps make a dollar. And of course, they have a very strong sense of injustice, the fact that they have been forced into these circumstances by their own government and in part by the American companies that have come to own so much of the land of Oriente province. They are the ones who have an affinity for the rebels, of course, because the rebels are fighting against the government. And at the same time, it is the peasants who have the knowledge that will allow the rebels to survive in the months ahead without them. Uh, 
the cause would have been lost early on. And it's clear, for example, from the writings of Che Guevara that it's at this time that the rebels begin a real identification with the poor people of the countryside. As much as there might have been rhetoric in the past about social justice and so forth, and now it really comes to have a meaning for Castro and his people, for the 26th of July movement, as their very existence comes to depend upon the peasants, and as they come to recognize the full impact of events in Cuba in the first half of the 20th century upon these rural people. And if Castro's revolution uh, begins to radicalize, it's as a result of these encounters. Uh, in some ways, uh, it's a, somewhat akin to what happened in China uh, to Mao Zedong, in the sense that his relationship with peasants in the countryside helps convince him of a certain social philosophy about creating an equitable society based on peasant communities. Well, in some sense, Castro is similarly influenced, even though, again, he's not a Marxist in any true sense of the term as of 1956. Nevertheless, uh, he is rapidly going to develop a strong sense of uh, social justice for these people, and one of the key precepts of his revolution will be the effort to transform the countryside and to bring economic and social justice to these people in the countryside uh, as the revolution unfolds. Now, of course, not everything is focused on Castro in this period, 1956 to uh, the beginning of 1959. Uh, Castro is one of a number of people who are opposing uh, Batista, uh, including former presidents of Cuba, like uh, President Prio, who's living in exile with many other Cubans in Miami and supplying money to various opposition groups. There is an armed urban front uh, that is taking up weapons against the Batista regime as well. But it is also true as time goes on, as we move from 1956 to 57, uh, and certainly by the beginning of 1958, that it is Castro who emerges as perhaps the best known figure in the resistance, in part simply by his very survival, that he's continued to oppose uh, Batista and has survived Batista's repeated efforts through the military to wipe out his bases uh, in Oriente province in the mountains. And this helps give a certain mystique to Castro, that he has survived, he has challenged their regime, and he's a master at also publicity. I mean, he's getting a fair amount of international publicity for his efforts. He's being interviewed, for example, by American correspondents. He's appeared on American television with films of him at his rebel base camp. So even though his rebel force remains relatively small, their ability to survive and to challenge their regime uh, gives them an influence over subsequent events uh, that is beyond the sheer number of people involved in this part of the rebellion. By 1958, the rebels are able to launch attacks with a high degree of frequency and reasonable effectiveness against Batista's regime early in 1958. This does not mean that they're in a position to do topple Batista at this time. Uh, again, their influence is still largely confined to Oriente province and particularly to the mountainous and rural areas. Nevertheless, the United States is becoming increasingly concerned about events in Cuba. You know, what is happening here, uh, this challenge to Batista? Uh, they have long seen Batista as an ally. They have worked closely with him. Uh, both back in the 1930s that helped to bring Batista to power, and his coming to power was in part uh, a result of U.S. support for him, and at the same time he has been a faithful ally of the United States during his times in power. But now, uh, in 1958, the United States is increasingly concerned about his survivability. Uh, it is clear, both due to incidents in urban areas, uh, bombings, assassinations that occur, that the urban fronts are becoming increasingly active in their opposition to the regime. And it's also clear that Castro's influence and his ability to strike out at the government is growing as well. Finally, uh, in the early fall of 1958, the U.S. government uh, imposes an arms embargo on Cuba. In other words, it bans the shipment of U.S. weapons to Cuba. Now, this is aimed, obviously, at the Cuban government. Why? because the United States is trying to pressure Batista to step down. They're hoping that if he steps down, 
that they can put together some type of coalition government in place that will prevent what they fear are more radical forces like Castro, they're not exactly sure what Castro is up to, but whatever it is, they're suspicious. To prevent people like Castro from taking power, they would rather see a civilian military junta appointed uh, in place of Batista. So they recognize the growing weakness of Batista's position and the instability, which is, of course, once again, damaging U.S. interests. You know, they've been through this before, 1898, 1933, when their ally in Cuba clearly is weakening, uh, as Spain was in 1898, as Machado was in 1933. It's time to move on, uh, time to find another figure who can establish stability. And in this case, it's Batista who they want to get rid of. And it had become, certainly by the 1950s, an accepted reality in Cuba that one did not survive as president of Cuba, as the ruler of Cuba, without American support. And if the Americans withdrew that support, then one's days were numbered. So the arms embargo, more than its practical effect in terms of would it really seriously deny weapons uh, to the Cuban military, it wasn't going to have a major impact upon the outcome of the arms struggle. It was more a signal to people that the United States was losing faith in Batista's ability to survive. And that was a signal to people generally that, well, this regime's days must be numbered because if the U.S. is cutting off support, it's going to be all over at some point. And if they're not giving military aid, they might continue economic relations, which they did. But if they're cutting off their military support, they're making it clear that they expect uh, this regime to be gone, that they want to replace it with somebody else. The government's response to this, Batista's reaction, is essentially defiance. He doesn't care about, well, he does care, but he's going to act like he doesn't care uh, about the U.S. arms embargo. Uh, in fact, we'll go on fighting uh, despite that embargo. He knows that the practical impact in the short term will be very limited, and he's still confident that he can, in fact, uh, subdue the rebels. And in the summer and early fall, he launches a major campaign specifically targeting uh, Castro and his army in Oriente province with the understanding that this is the group that had clearly, by this time, established themselves as the leaders of the revolutionary forces. There may be a variety of different groups opposing Batista, but clearly Castro and his followers were the ones that most people recognized in Cuba as the leaders of the revolution. So if he can defeat them, he can survive this challenge to his regime. However, that attempt at bringing down Castro is a failure. Uh, by this time in Cuba, the Cuban military itself was marked by considerable degrees of corruption. There had been a loss of esprit de corps, in other words, a sense of dedication uh, within the military. For so long, the military had really become uh, simply a wing of the government designed to suppress domestic uh, rebellion uh, against various governments. Uh, there was a good deal of corruption within the regime in terms of the use of uh, budget uh, to line the pockets of officers. Troops were often poorly paid, and treated, and trained. And as a result, the Cuban army isn't a terribly effective fighting force unless it's going up against largely unarmed civilians. And that proves to be the case in this uh, offensive by the government in late summer and early fall. Uh, and they find that many troops simply do not want to advance up into the mountains and risk their lives for whatever it is uh, that the uh, Batista government is fighting for. So this offensive, rather than crushing Castro's forces, proves to be a disaster for Batista uh, and demonstrates the increasing uh, dispirited attitude of much of the Cuban military. From here, events are going to begin to unwind for um, Batista very rapidly. With the failure of the government offensive, the rebels launch attacks into central Cuba. And in the weeks after the offensive, they are beginning to spread their influence here into central Cuba with the fall of Santa Clara. It's not on this map, but it's one of the uh, key uh, provincial capitals uh, of central Cuba. With the fall of Santa Clara, uh, it becomes clear that the Batista government's days are numbered. Uh, they simply cannot survive. Although Batista tries to pass this off as insignificant. The ability of the rebels, and specifically a rebel column led by Che Guevara, to move out of Oriente province and strike uh, 
deep into the heart of uh, the interior of the country in the central provinces made it clear that Batista was rapidly losing control of the situation. Now he tries to maintain uh, an appearance of normality, even scheduling the usual New Year's Eve party for himself and his political supporters in Havana. But the truth is that just at that time, he is actually preparing his departure. He's going to flee to Miami, will eventually uh, spend the rest of his life uh, in exile. Uh, so with his departure, uh, as of January 1st, 1959, uh, the Batista regime, the old order, has collapsed. There's a brief effort to organize an alternative government consisting of military and civilian figures, an effort that's backed by the United States. Uh, but Castro is already moving rapidly across the country in a convoy towards the capital. And when he arrives, uh, just a, a week after uh, Batista's departure, uh, it's clear that he is in control of the situation, uh, that he is the revolutionary hero. Here is the man that has ousted the corrupt dictator uh, by force of arms and taken power, and generally there is jubilation in the country uh, for the end of the Batista regime, a jubilation that really stretches across all socioeconomic categories. But that kind of unanimous support for Castro will not last terribly long. Now, the aims of the revolution are not fully defined when Castro comes to power. He has written, history will absolve me after his capture at Moncada. Uh, he has certainly developed some ideas as a result of his experience in the Sierra Maestra in the mountains of Oriente Province. Uh, but exactly what the government intends to do, what future it projects, uh, for Cuba is not entirely clear as of January of 1959. This is unlike China, unlike Russia, where you have organized, highly disciplined ideological groups uh, who have made it clear from the beginning what their vision of the future is. This is far less clear in the case of Castro. Much of what he has written and said uh, could easily be put into the mouth or the pen of someone like Jose Marti or other leaders that had tried to bring change in Cuba. Where the revolution is going is made clear in part by what Castro comes to call the first law of the revolution, uh, which is issued in May of 1959, and it is the Agrarian Reform Law. It calls for the breakup of all the large agricultural estates in Cuba. Anything over about 1,200 acres uh, would be broken up and land would be redistributed. Partly to peasants, much of it would be turned into uh, state farms because you can't take um, sugar plantations. Everyone recognizes sugar still has to be a major factor in the Cuban economy. Uh, you can't uh, take tiny peasant plots and effectively grow sugar. Another reality here is that Cuba is not really a peasant society of the type that we have seen in these other revolutions. If we look at much of the Cuban countryside, particularly after the uh, American investments uh, that came uh, following the American intervention, most of Cuban countryside is broken up into large sugar plantations. These are not situations where you have millions of peasants who have small plots or losing their land. These people in the countryside are mostly essentially rural proletarians, people who go to work every day for a wage on a sugar plantation. They're hired X number of days a year to plant the sugar cane, then to harvest it. Other people work in the mills. And these, this is a rural proletariat. So that great urge for land reform that we see in places like China and Russia and even Mexico in the 20th century is far less an issue in Cuba. It's not to say that there aren't people who do have land, who have had land and want it back and want to be peasants, but you do not have that same overwhelming peasant population in Cuba that you have in places like Russia and China. Much of that has been wiped away in the past century by the vast expansion of the great sugar plantations. What people in the countryside are looking for in particular is a better life for themselves. Most Cubans that work in the sugar fields only get to work about 90 to 120 days a year. That's all they're needed for in terms of planting and harvesting. Uh, if they get four months, maybe five months of work a year, then they're unemployed the rest of the year. They don't have housing that's decent. They don't have 
educational facilities. They don't have health care. Uh, these are the kinds of concerns people have. So the land reform, although it is of compelling importance, does not have the same focus and orientation as, let us say, in China, where the idea was to directly put land back into the hands of peasants. There's some of that, but most of it is the idea of taking land out of the hands of the great plantation owners, having the government take it over and run it, and trying to create, in the process, a more equitable society in the countryside. That law and its implementation in the months that follow, 1959 and 1960, begins the process of conflict within Cuba because it makes it clear uh, to a vast number of Cubans in the upper classes uh, who had not necessarily been supporters of Batista that their days were numbered in terms of their economic interests in Cuba. Obviously when Castro first came to power, a number of Batista's followers were put on trial, executed, and others fled knowing that they were no longer welcome. Uh, but now with the uh, agrarian reform law, uh, much of the Cuban elite uh, involved in the agrarian process, whether it's sugar plantations, cattle estates, they realize that their days are numbered as well because the, lot, the bulk of their wealth is going to be taken from them in this massive uh, takeover, in this massive agrarian reform movement. Uh, so here begins the intense conflict in Cuba. Uh, over these issues. And many of these people in subsequent months will flee Cuba rather than uh, face a reality of losing much of their wealth in the agrarian reform process. Another step of change that comes as a result of Castro's taking power uh, is to confront American companies. Uh, in part, this happens with the agrarian reform law because, of course, there are massive U.S. interests in sugar and in uh, other areas of the economy, including cattle ranching. Uh, in sugar, U.S. dominance wasn't quite as great as it once was. In terms of ownership of plantations, it was about 55 percent. But still, there are very large U.S. interests, including United Fruit, that are being nationalized as a result of agrarian reform. So to large cattle ranching interests, the uh, King Ranch in Texas had massive holdings in Cuba they'll be lost to the agrarian reform process. In addition to these rural interests, uh, in the urban areas, uh, one of the constant complaints of Cubans was that the American utility companies charge much higher rates in Cuba than they charge in the United States, which happened to be true. Uh, as a result, Castro issues orders that ITT, the telephone monopoly, and General Electric that generates most of the electricity in the country simply have to lower their rates. They're going to be forced to cut rates by about a third or so. And they'll simply have to accept that as a reality. This is a nationalization at this point, but it is addressing some of the deep-rooted concerns that people have that they're being exploited by American corporations. Now, these kinds of actions by the new Cuban government a land reform that leads to massive loss of property by large American companies and rate reductions that are causing serious problems for large American corporations like ITT and General Electric inevitably prompt a response from the U.S. government and that is the United States reduces the Cuban sugar quota and eventually eliminates it entirely. So suddenly Cuba is not going to have that guaranteed market in sugar that it once had. And this is a serious problem because, in general, the world sugar market is highly competitive. There are all kinds of countries producing sugar, whether it's uh, cane sugar, such as in Cuba or in the Philippines, or beet sugar, and such as in the United States. Uh, to lose a guaranteed market was a, an enormous blow to Cuba. And furthermore, looking around, uh, there were no other large markets that were in close proximity to Cuba. And the United States was there 90 miles away. Uh, this was an ideal opportunity. Uh, but on the other hand, if that guaranteed market was lost, uh, other countries were there to compete. The U.S. had its own large sugar business. Brazil produced large amounts of sugar. So Cuba was in serious trouble when this happened. And of course, what the U.S. government was doing was essentially saying, look, we don't like the government in Cuba. We're going to take some measures to indicate our dislike. And usually when we do that, we get our way. The, Cuban government in question responds and does what they're supposed to do. Instead, uh, 
Castro's answer was to turn to the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union agrees to begin buying Cuban sugar at a highly favorable rate. After this set of confrontations comes a wave of outright nationalizations of U.S. corporate interests, such as the oil companies, Standard Oil, Texaco, Shell. Uh, this set of nationalizations occurred not so much out of specific ideological decisions. Again, this is still not a government that's decided it's really a socialist government yet. Instead, what had happened was that uh, as a part of the economic problems with the United States, the Cubans had gone looking for other sources of inputs to their economy. The Soviet Union had agreed to start supplying oil uh, to Cuba and oil at a price below world market price. The U.S. oil companies that own the refineries in Cuba said that they would not refine that oil because it would violate existing price structures in the uh, oil market at that time. Therefore, Castro struck back and nationalized the U.S. refineries. But then in August of 1960, Castro goes a step further and nationalizes both U.S. utilities and U.S. banks. And now it's becoming clear that this isn't just a matter of, well, look, at, we need to carry out land reform and the U.S. companies got in the way. Uh, we wanted to buy oil from the Soviet Union and the U.S. oil companies were being obstructionist. Uh, here, it's clear that this is an, an outright expression of Cuban nationalism, that Cuba is going to control its own economy, and we're simply going to eliminate the American presence in our economy. economy. We're not going to allow American investment to dominate Cuba's internal economy anymore. We're going to take over the large American corporations that are here uh, in sectors such as the utilities, the sugar mills, and the banks. So this now, at least, if it's not socialism, is certainly indicating the strong influence of nationalism in Cuba by this time that we're going to strike back and demonstrate our independence from the United States and specifically our economic independence by taking over American investments. The American response, again, going back to uh, past practice when a Cuban government was proving to be uncooperative, uh, put on the pressure, in this case the economic pressure. They've already reduced the Cuban sugar quota and now uh, they impose a trade embargo in October of that year. And this would mean that Cuba's most important trading partner was now eliminated. And this, again, was bound to have an enormous cost to Cuba because clearly its most efficient trading partner is the United States because it's so close and because it's such an enormous market and can so readily supply all the necessities that Cuba has. Cuba although it has some degree of industrialization, has pretty much uh, over the course of the first half of the 20th century evolved as an agricultural factory. It produces one major product, sugar, and exports that to the United States and in return gets a variety of inputs, whether it's you know, utilities, whether it's fuel, uh, electrical equipment, telephone equipment, uh, manufacture of automobiles, etc. This exchange worked effectively, at least in terms of relative cost, because the United States was so close to Cuba. Transport costs for shipping sugar to the United States were relatively low. The cost of shipping goods to Cuba was low in return. Now that market has been wiped out. Now it's going to cost Cuba a lot more wherever it trades because it's going to have to ship its goods a lot further and it's going to have to pay to ship imports a lot further than it ever had to in the past. So. This was meant to be and was indeed a major body blow to this revolutionary movement. Now, part of the response of the revolutionary government uh, is to engage in mass mobilizations. How are they going to deal with these problems as they transform the economy, as they face challenges from the United States that is opposing these changes? They set up committees for the defense of the revolution, a way of activating the population, of bringing the Cuban people directly into the process of revolutionary change. Committees that would help decide uh, how things were to be managed locally. Uh, these kinds of committees would manage community affairs. You'd have other types of committees uh, helping to manage uh, sugar mills and other types of operations. So an attempt to create uh, 
uh, not an elected democracy, but rather a representative democracy in the sense that people would have local committees on which they would sit and in which they could have a say in what was going on in their community uh, and in their factory. It's very much, for example, like uh, going to a neighborhood, you know, a civic association meeting. You know. Did someone elect you and say you could go to the meeting? No, because I live here in this neighborhood. I have a right to go to this meeting, and I have a right to have a say and influence on how things are managed in my community. That's what these kinds of committees were meant to do, was to give people a say in the management of their own affairs. Now, by this time, uh, the relationship between the Soviet Union and Cuba has drawn much closer. They are now linked economically with the sale of sugar, with uh, the Soviets supplying oil and other vital necessities that Cuba can no longer secure from the United States. And even without that relationship, Castro has clearly uh, defied American interests by massive nationalization of U.S. corporate interests. Uh, by the time all of this is said and done and the nationalizations will be completed by uh, 1962, uh, over one and a half billion dollars of U.S. investment will have essentially disappeared as a result of these nationalizations. The United States government is convinced that Castro has become a communist, that if he wasn't already one in their minds before he even took power, and that of course his interests are inimical to those of the United States. U.S. economic interests are being sacrificed wholesale, some type of socialist society is apparently being created, and he is drawing closer to the Soviet Union. Even leaving aside ideology, remember the United States never wanted to have any powerful competitor control Cuba, and here Castro is drawing closer to the Soviet Union. In light of these developments, uh, the United States would attempt to overthrow uh, the Castro government in 1961. The Central Intelligence Agency would train some 1,400 Cubans to invade the island with the hope that the invasion would spark a mass rebellion against Castro and topple his regime. Interestingly enough, the place where the CIA chose to invade Cuba in hopes of sparking this rebellion was on the south coast of Cuba at the city of Trinidad. In other words, the exact place where Narcisco Lopez had tried to launch his rebellion uh, back in the 1840s to spark a rebellion then against the Spanish. And this invasion, at, uh, originally planned for Trinidad, uh, met with the same failure as Narcisco Lopez's operation. The only difference is that the planners actually shifted the location further west here to the Bay of Pigs uh, because they believed that that was a more uh, ideal location for their invasion. In the end, however, it had the same effect uh, as Narcisco Lopez's failed invasion of the 1840s, and that was it was met with massive resistance uh, specifically by the Cuban people and the invaders were routed and eventually uh, most of them were taken prisoner and the others killed on the beach uh, at the Bay of Pigs in 1961. These events actually further strengthened Castro's position as a true nationalist. Here he is defying the United States at every step of the way. He has engaged in massive nationalizations of American interests he has moved closer to the Soviet Union, and then uh, in the face of uh, cutting of the sugar quota, the trade embargo, he refuses to step back, and then when the United States actually tries to use military force, a paramilitary uh, operation to oust his regime, he successfully defeats them. If anything, uh, his support in Cuba actually skyrockets as a result of this kind of factor. Uh, because he is clearly establishing himself as the first Cuban leader in the 20th century to truly stand up uh, to the United States and defy the United States and assert complete independence. Now, Castro at the same time realized that he was, you know, fighting a giant and that he could hardly hope to survive in the long run if the United States chose to use its own military force against him and he is looking for a means of survival. And that means he secures from the Soviet Union when he convinces the Soviet Union to send him uh, arms uh, missiles uh, with the potential 
uh, that those missiles could carry nuclear weapons uh, to be trained on the United States and serve as the main defense for Cuba against the United States. Should the United States launch an all-out military attack on Cuba, the missiles could be fired at the United States. When the U.S. government learns of uh, the presence of missiles in Cuba as a result of spy plane operations, uh, it immediately demands their removal and in effect establishes a blockade around Cuba to prevent further Soviet shipments of the missiles to the island. Finally, uh, the Soviet government backs down and agrees that they will withdraw the missiles. However, the United States, in turn, agrees that it will not engage in any further concerted efforts to overthrow the Castro government. So it is uh, a historic moment, uh, a near nuclear uh, war uh, emer could have emerged out of uh, these events. But what it also asserts is essentially the status quo. The United States will remain hostile to Cuba, but Cuba will remain independent and will not be subject to direct military threats by the United States as a result of the agreements growing out of these events. Now, while all of this is happening uh, on the side of nationalism that we can see here, uh, the expression of Cuban concerns that had been generated down through their history over their position within their own society vis-a-vis -vis external forces. In other words, how Cubans felt about Spanish rule and the dominance of Spanish citizens within their own society during the period of colonialism. How Cubans felt in 1933 about the continued domination by the United States, the frequent use of the Platt Amendment, the domination of American economic interests, that those kinds of concerns and concerns about being Americanized, about being second-class citizens within their own society as compared to Americans. All of these nationalistic concerns had clearly come to the fore in the confrontation with uh, the United States beginning in 1959 with the agrarian reform law. So that part of the revolution has clearly been laid out here. We can see how Castro has given vent to these long-standing nationalist concerns on the island and in fact has enhanced his power and been strengthened by the American efforts to go back and use devices that they had used in the past of uh, denying Cuba trade, economic aid, etc. These things actually strengthen Castro because Castro is building upon this long-standing nationalistic concern in Cuba that Cuba be independent politically and economically, uh, that Americans not dictate uh, events in Cuba in terms of its politics, in terms of dominating its economy, in terms of uh, trying to uh, influence uh, Cuba's cultural development, that all of these things Castro was asserting uh, through his actions the right of Cuba to be truly independent. But there's another side to the revolution as well that has to do with internal conditions as well, and that is the effort to transform Cuba itself and what was Cuba to become. By 1962, after the events of the Bay of Pigs invasion and the missile crisis, it is then that Castro, in fact, makes it clear that this is to be a socialist economy, that he has settled upon uh, that as the model for the future. So we have a revolution that was really a revolution in the making. It's fairly clear that Castro and his followers, no matter what their uh, goals might have been early on, did not have a clear idea of what kind of society they really wanted to create in Cuba uh, in the early days. They wanted a more just society, they wanted less U.S. influence, but exactly what form Cuba was to take in the future in terms of its economic and social institutions and political institutions was absolutely unclear. It is only in the course of these events uh, in 1959, 60, and 61 that Castro moves inexorably towards a position of socialism. Yes, he was a nationalist, that was clear in each of the encounters with the Americans right from the start, but as far as his social and economic philosophy, that only emerges in full in these early years after the seizure of power. And it's only in 1962 that the government announces that indeed it is in the process of creating a socialist economy. So now the focus becomes what is Cuba to be, how is it to be shaped by the revolutionary government in achieving that kind of socialist society. 
One thing that becomes apparent early on, even before socialism, is the clear goal, is that these changes are causing a sloughing off in Cuban society, meaning layers of Cubans, uh, particularly the upper layers of Cuban society, are fleeing the country. Over 200,000 emigres that I point out here, uh, well, almost 200,000 between 1960 and 62, and the figures will eventually grow to a million uh, people who flee the island. Uh, early on, it consists particularly of large landowners, uh, people with uh, considerable amounts of wealth. Later on, it will include people who have uh, urban properties, such as uh, people who are landlords. They find that uh, the government decrees that rents on apartments are now to be fixed. Landlords don't like that, aren't going to be making much of a profit with fixed rents, and tens of thousands of the upper classes of Cuba will flee in the face of these kinds of changes. With them gone, the question becomes what kind of economy is to be created in the place of the one that they manage along with American corporate interests. Now the American corporations are gone and uh, the well-to-do of Cuba are gone as well. What type of economic and social system will be created to replace them? Initially, the model that Castro and his people follow is one akin to that of the Soviet Union and China, an attempt at massive industrialization. It was generally believed at this time, and not just by socialists, but by uh, development economists around the world, that if a country was really going to be developed, if it was going to achieve economic development, you had to industrialize. If you looked at the models that had already succeeded, whether you talk about Europe, the United States, Japan, all of them involved industrialization. So Cuba was going to attempt to become an industrial power in its own right, to build steel plants, automobile plants, uh, basic manufacturing facilities. Uh, to industrialize and end its dependence on sugar. So sugar was seen to be the great burden of Cuba. As much as it had brought economic growth in the past, it had become uh, an enormous burden because it left Cuba dependent upon this one crop whose price could fluctuate so wildly from year to year. Now Cuba wanted to become self-sufficient as an industrial power, much like the United States or Western European governments or countries are. However, the early experiments in industrialization proved to be failures. Uh, they ran up against the reality that Cuba does not have the type of resource base that would readily allow it to industrialize in terms of access to a wide array of raw materials, uh, whether iron, coal, there are some of these products in Cuba, but not a wide distribution as far as energy sources has to import the oil that it needs. It's very difficult to build a modern industrial society when the resource base is extremely limited. And the fact was Cuba was trying in the 1960s to catch up to societies that had undergone massive industrialization 50, 100 years ago or more. But it's particularly this limitation on resource bases that convinced the government finally to shift back to sugar, and that sugar would have to continue to be the main prop of the economy. But even as that occurred, even as the government agreed that uh, sugar would still have to be the main source of support for the economy, there are social revolutionary goals that are being sought in the midst of trying to develop the sugar economy. Specifically, the idea of relying on moral incentives. And here we can see uh, some of the ideas of Mao Zedong uh, and their influence. In other words, we want people to work not because they're going to get paid a wage, but because they are working for the greater good of society. We will assure that people get housing, that they get you know, medical treatment, that they get food that they need, but we don't want them saying, well, I'm going to work another four hours today because I'm going to get an extra you know, dollar fifty in my paycheck per hour. We want them to work those additional hours because it is for the greater good of Cuba and for the Cuban people. This is the same kind of idea as Mao Zedong in the sense of creating a just society, an equitable society in which people are focused uh, on the greater good of the group as a whole rather than simply their individual ambitions. The Moral Incentives Program was not highly successful. It simply went contrary to realities that people had basic material needs and interests that they wanted to pursue and they were looking for monetary incentives instead. The other great goal that's established in this period is the idea that sugar can be used to not simply sustain but actually expand the economy. 
and Cuba in, begins setting uh, production quotas. And in 1970, uh, the quota is for a 10 million ton harvest, far beyond anything Cuba had ever achieved in the past. Typical harvest in the past were five, six million tons a year. Now Cuba is going to try to take this great leap forward. So we see this attempt, uh, again, somewhat akin to uh, what was happening in China, what happened in China to, uh, one, create a society in which people are focused on the larger interests of society as a whole, and at the same time to make this massive and sudden leap forward in economic growth and development, in this case through the use of the sugar harvest. But much like the moral incentives, uh, the attempt at the 10 million ton harvest falls far short, several million tons short uh, of this optimistic projection. And along the way, it causes serious setbacks because there are irrationalities that enter into the system. In other words, people are being pulled off other much needed projects, road work, construction of power stations, etc., and thrown into the fields to try to harvest enough sugar to meet this goal. So in the end, uh, this goal of reaching 10 million tons not only proves elusive, but actually damaging to the economy because people are, and resources are being misdirected away from other needed activities into the sole action of generating this enormous harvest. Out of the failure of 1970 comes a recognition that the political system is going to have to adjust and focus on more realistic goals in terms of diversified economic growth, some industrialization, light industry, uh, obviously maintaining the sugar economy because it's still the basic uh, support of the economic system in Cuba, but also venturing into areas like tourism to attract people and dollars into the economy. That diversification was going to have to be the reality, plus decentralization, less immediate direction from Havana itself, allowing local planners to try to develop the economy and take advantage of local opportunities with their knowledge of the local economy, that this is a far more efficient way to plan and to manage than with all direction coming from the top. And finally, pay incentives, that in fact people were going to have to get some kind of material incentives if they were going to be expected to produce more effectively, to work harder, uh, to achieve some of these economic goals. Now, if the effects of the revolution in trying to turn Cuba into a developed economy are mixed at best, and indeed they are, and there are a series of failures uh, that strike Cuba in these years, uh, the industrialization plan, the 10 million ton harvest, and then of course Cuba is constantly battling with the problem that the United States has imposed and maintains a, an economic embargo against Cuba. Uh, and therefore makes it far more expensive for Cuba uh, to survive in terms of its trade because everything costs more because it has to trade with far-flung trading partners such as the Soviet Union. And then on top of this, in the late 80s, the collapse of the Soviet Union itself, the end of the uh, Soviet agreement to buy Cuban sugar, each of these uh, realities uh, has imposed enormous uh, economic sufferings upon Cuba uh, down through the decades. And clearly, the economy has not grown in the way that Castro and his revolutionary partners had once hoped. Uh, certainly, uh, Cubans do not starve, but on the other hand, Cuba has fallen far behind other countries in trying to achieve high levels of economic growth and development. However, if we look at the third aspect of the revolution, beyond its nationalistic agenda, beyond the agenda of development that uh, Castro uh, sets in the early 1960s, and look at internal changes in terms of creating a more equitable society, there we do see dramatic changes coming about as a result of the revolutionary government. One of the key factors uh, for Castro and his followers was economic democracy. Both the influence of uh, Marxist doc doctrine, but even more importantly, the experience that the rebels had in Oriente province among the peasants convinced Castro and his followers that indeed their central goal had to be cre to create a society in which there was relative equality among the population so that wage scales uh, were relatively equitable. That even though large numbers of people were going to be trained in uh, middle-class professions as doctors and scientists, etc., 
that the wage scales or the living standards of those in the professions versus those who are workers and peasants would not be as drastically different as one would find in a capitalist society. So there has been an ongoing attempt to achieve that kind of goal. And how would that be achieved? Well, in part by making so much of society's services available to people free of charge. For example, literacy program. Literacy program in Cuba has been an enormous success where most of the rural population was illiterate at the time of the revolution. Now more than 90 percent of the population throughout Cuba is literate. So when education becomes free and readily available, uh, in fact the uh, revolutionary government devoted much of its time in the 1960s to building schools, particularly in the countryside where they were not previously available, to providing uh, high school education for the general populace and providing university education, not universally because not everyone is going to want or need a university education, but making it available essentially based on talent. Uh, a radical shift in society occurred as virtually everyone had access to the educational process and one's access to higher education was largely determined by one's abilities. You know, do you have, you know, does your high school record indicate the ability to go to college and you know, to become a doctor or a scientist or a teacher or whatever? Fine, then you'll be going on in that direction. So it was essentially universal free education. This means that a basic resource which people so often have to pay for in one form or another uh, in capitalist society would not have to be paid for in Cuba. Another one, strike close to home for most Americans today, free medical services. That essentially all medical services are free in Cuba. Uh, is the level of technological development the same in Cuba as it is here? By no means. But on the other hand, uh, health conditions are, the general health of the populace is quite good because people can gain access uh, to doctors and nurses uh, with relative ease uh, compared to this country, in part because a, an enormous number of people have been trained in these professions over the years, so there is not a very narrow and restricted uh, flow of professionals in the healthcare area. Uh, so healthcare becomes, again, universally and freely available to the population. This, again, makes an enormous difference in living standards because, one, people are not paying for their health care, and two, it means that the health of uh, the poorer segments of society is just about equal to that of the upper elements of society because they all have access to these health services, uh, which, of course, as has been discovered in the United States, preventive medicine has an enormously beneficial impact upon the general health of the population. So this is another way of narrowing uh, differences between people uh, within society, even though one person may be a doctor, another may be a day laborer, if they can gain equal and ready access to these types of so social services, whether it's medicine or education, then their living standards are more comparable. Another more direct way of doing this is through rationing. Uh, uh, some of this is made necessary by sheer shortages of products in Cuba, but some of it is also a deliberate effort to uh, eliminate economic disparities. Now, again, there is no perfect system. There are always ways that people can use money to buy products that are not readily available in the ration system. On the other hand, the rationing system through the years, until recent years in particular, provide a fairly consistent flow of goods uh, to most of the population on a relatively equitable level. In other words, uh, certain basics, whether it's you know, food, cleaning products, etc., clothing, uh, are available under this system and most people have relatively equal access to those products. So rationing is another way of creating, if you will, wealth redistribution, of creating a more equitable system uh, within the society as a whole. One of the most uh, compelling aspects of this whole process has been a regional differentiation that whereas in the past wealth tended to concentrate in the urban areas and particularly in Havana, uh, the whole thrust of the regime up until recent years has been towards moving resources out of the urban areas and into the countryside. One of the things that foreign visitors to Cuba always remark upon is the uh, 
uh, poor condition of Havana itself as an urban center, the decline and decay of public and private buildings, etc. And it's certainly very true because the resources that are available have been poured into the countryside, building housing, medical clinics, and schools for people in the rural areas, rebalancing uh, the flow of resources. Now, some of this is changing in recent years as the government puts a stress on tourism, trying to uh, refurbish parts of Havana and build tourist hotels, bring in foreign corporations to build them as a way of attracting money. But the fact is, over the 40-year course of the revolution, the flow has been largely away from urban centers and into the rural areas to, again, redress issues of poverty and social and economic inequality. Finally, the impact of some of this, uh, particularly in the early years of the revolution, is made apparent with these figures, uh, where the income level of the lowest 40 percent of the population has gone or went over a 20-year period from $182 per person to $865. Uh, seems like pathetically small amounts of money to us, but then if you're poor in a third world country, mm -hmm. pathetically small mm -hmm. has an entirely different meaning. Uh, what it shows is a radical mm -hmm. reshaping of wealth standards in this society. And the fact is, uh, even if you know, things like uh, meat and fine clothes, etc., are not readily available or as readily available as in our own society, uh, people at the lower end of the economic and social strata were benefited tremendously by the revolution. They simply had more resources at their command than they ever had before in their lives, and which also helps explain the continuing popularity of the regime in Cuba for most people. Uh, even with a dictatorial regime, uh, these kinds of changes have had an enormous impact. Trying to summarize the Cuban Revolution uh, does not fall as easily into the categories uh, that I've talked about in the past, although we're certainly going to cover them here. In other words, can I clearly break it out for you in terms of simple causations, goals, and outcomes? Not as easily as in other cases, particularly when it comes uh, to goals and talking about specific groups, and I'll explain that in a moment. But if we want to look at the causes of the revolution, it is fairly clear and it is easy for us to say that there were really two aspects of causation in the revolution. The revolution is a social and national revolution. It is a social revolution based upon the fact that so much of Cuba's population was an impoverished rural population that from the time of the Great Depression on never really recovered even the limited amount of well-being that they experienced prior to that time. Desperate poverty in the countryside is clearly a contributing factor, helps stir the peasants who support and the other rural residents who support Castro, along with frustrated elements of the middle class. Remember, these are people who were denied equal economic opportunity with Americans through most of their history. This is a country that could produce a large educated middle class, but where so many people had to turn to politics because there were so few economic opportunities in the private sector itself. So we have both a frustrated middle class and a desperately poor rural population who join together in the hopes of creating a more equitable society. And we have at the same time a strong nationalist element the long history of U.S. involvement and dominance in the economic and political realms, the efforts of Americans to Americanize Cubans, all of these factors contributed to the nationalistic aspect of the revolution and are made clear in Castro's pronouncements and in his policies that he's going to assert Cuban independence. And two, we see in Castro's policies trying to create economic democracy, uh, trying to create a more equitable society, the response to the social aspect of the revolution. So the social and nationalistic causations, I think, are very clear in the case of Cuba. I said it's hard to talk about goals in this revolution, at least in the same way that we talk about them in other revolutions. That's because Cuba, at the time of the revolution, after the events of 1933 and subsequent repressions, had become such an atomized society. We do not have in Cuba, at the time of Castro's revolution, clearly defined social groups, political movements representing the middle class, working class, uh, the upper class, 
Castro's revolution itself does not have a clear ideological definition. Cuban society had become highly atomized, broken up into fragments. That is one of the reasons why Castro is able to succeed in taking power. It is why he is able to eventually steer the revolution in the course that he chooses because of the acute fragmentation of Cuban society. So unlike other revolutions, we cannot readily point to clear divisions of classes, the middle class wanting this, the peasant classes wanting that. We do know that there is a general longing in Cuba for a more equitable society and for the assertion of true Cuban independence. Those factors, although they're not specifically articulated by one or two social groups within society, clearly are the goals of the revolution as much as they are the causes of the revolution. And Castro's ability to enunciate and implement those goals are, is what make him able to succeed in his revolution. As far as accomplishments, we have seen those. The assertion of independence, particularly from the United States with the nationalizations and the refusal to give in to American pressures, economic democracy, through free health care, free literacy campaigns, uh, efforts at redistribution of income, and social democracy, uh, creating a society in which people do feel that they are true participants in the making of their own society, the revolutionary committees, etc. In that sense, the Cuban Revolution has gone on a very long way in achieving goals that it set for itself. However, in attempting to achieve a true economic development for Cuba, and in attempts to achieve the ideal of a fully equitable society in which human beings are focused on true equality rather than selfish interests. Here, Castro, like Mao Zedong before him, has been unable to achieve that particular idealistic goal. As for economic development, it may well be that Cuba too will go down China's path in the years ahead and follow a state capitalist model to achieve economic development. In the process, however, it may have to sacrifice its ideal of a truly equitable society in which all individuals are focused on the well-being of their fellow citizens and of society as a whole.